Yeah. Okay, it's four o'clock, so I think we should get going. And uh, I know it's a late in the afternoon, hard to get people out of their afternoon slump, but uh, hopefully this will be interesting. I know we're competing with some other somewhat similar sessions, so hopefully people will still be drifting in. Uh, anyhow, my name's Bob Chen. I am uh, a director of a center at Columbia University called Season, and I manage uh, for 13 more days the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, which for those of you who may not have been around as long as I have, uh, is a one of the founding uh, type one members of ESIP. So we've been around for a while. Um, uh, I will be replaced by uh, uh, our current deputy, Alex DeSherbinen, who's not here, but uh, many of you know Bob Downs, who's, who's wandering around and involved in a lot of ESIP activities. Um, so I'm pleased to have had the opportunity to co-organize this session with Tom Paris, who will be the first speaker. Uh, Tom is uh, uh, actually a longtime collaborator. We've known each other, we figured out 30 years <laughs> since Tom actually in a previous incarnation actually worked at Season when we were a nonprofit based in Michigan before we came to Columbia 25 years ago. Anyhow, uh, so Tom and I had this uh, idea that, that it would be worth talking about uh, open source geospatial uh, tools and environments. And in particular, not just focusing on the particular software, but uh, the words not up there, but uh, analytic environments because of the, you know, we want to think more broadly about the end-to-end -end management and analysis and use of, of data. And one of the things that seemed um, interesting was that uh, governments supporting this, a lot of different academics are working on this, but the private sector is also a key player. And Tom, after he left Season and some other places, now runs a company called iSciences, uh, which is a local, it's based here in Burlington. Um, so Tom will tell you a little more, including a chance to visit the their offices on Thursday. Um, uh, so we organize this session kind of around those perspectives of uh, developers, universities, and data centers. And so I'm really pleased to have uh, the people who uh, uh, agreed to speak today here. Uh, uh, first, as I mentioned, uh, Tom, who uh, has been, uh, you know, he's had a lot of different hats. Uh, uh, iSciences does does a whole range of uh, interdisciplinary work. Uh, they do a lot of work for the uh, sec on security issues for the intelligence community. He's worked uh, as an environmental librarian at Harvard University and, and um, kind of rose up to be managing uh, iSciences, which is a, a small business that, that uh, as I mentioned, we've partnered with. Uh, our, Next speaker is uh, Kendall Fortney, who is uh, program director at the Vermont Research Open Source Program Office, Verso, here at the University of Vermont. So he'll tell you more about that, uh, of course. And he's been involved in uh, geospatial technology in the state and has recently uh, become uh, in charge of this new program. Uh, and then we have the two government presenters, uh, Ryan Berkheimer. He says he's a federal physical scientist at the National Center for Environmental Information, uh, which as you know, has at least one center based in Asheville. So he lives in a town called Mars Hill, right? And which is uh, relevant because he, he said he started out in physics, hydrogeology and ecosystem restoration, but drifted into the spatio-temporally oriented software and system spaces. So sounds like Mars Hill's appropriate. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, again, he's from NOAA. Uh, the last speaker is Sarah Lubkin, who's uh, who did not send me her 
<laughs> but, um, and her position has changed recently, uh, which she can tell you about, but she works with uh, the uh, Earth System Data and Information System Project of NASA based at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, and she's actually recently kind of uh, taken a position overlooking all the NASA data centers, like the one um, uh, I have. So I have to be nice to her. Uh, anyhow, this is the uh, uh, program for this afternoon. And uh, we're going to go through the presentations. You know, we didn't want to go on too long, but we are going to hold questions to the end of the for presentations. And so uh, feel free. Uh, there is the Google Doc, uh, which hopefully you know how to get to that through Kiko Chat. Um, please enter your name and affiliation and uh, you know questions if you have. We will monitor that. We will try to monitor the uh, chat on the Zoom so people uh, can put uh, questions or or comments or raise your hand for later uh, in in Zoom, and we'll try to keep it as uh, balanced as possible. Uh, this is a I wasn't expecting kind of this amphitheater style room. I you know we do want to get into more of a discussion mode uh, after these presentations, so hopefully we can keep keep things flowing more interactively later. Uh, but why don't we start now with Tom? Uh, thanks, Bob, and welcome all uh, to Burlington. Um, it's a wonderful place to live and work, uh, except when it's uh, smoky and rainy. Um, so as Bob mentioned, we're local, uh, and we are having an open house at our offices uh, downtown, uh, so uh, literally across the street from City Hall Park, that downtown. Um, Thursday, 4.30 to 7. Uh, unfortunately, the perimeter doors close at 5.30. So if you get there after 5.30, call our main office number and someone will let you in. Um, iSciences is a, uh, we're a small work for hire geospatial data analytics company. Um, and more specifically, we tend to work over very large areas, so either continental or global scale analytics. Um, and we use geospatial analytics in sort of four uh, topical domains that are highly overlapping. So we do a lot of work in water and climate, corporate sustainability, human security, national security. So by human security, water, food, energy, public health and governance. Um, and we do both sort of foundational remote sensing. Uh, here's a picture of bi-directional reflectance distribution functions, and we maintain a model for, for uh, doing those. But we also do applied remote sensing. I can't talk about all of our projects, but I'm going to highlight a few. Uh, one is our water security indicator model. Um, and the, what we do is uh, uh, every month we put out a report. Uh, we monitor and forecast uh, surface water anomalies worldwide uh, with lead times of up to one, of one to nine months. Um, and we generally produce those within one to two weeks from the end of each month. And we look at sort of short-term phenomena with one month integration periods and to long-term phenomena with 12 month integration periods. And it's, it itself is an open source project that was funded uh, in part by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Oh, we're proud this month that we uh, increased the resolution by uh, an order of magnitude. So we're, we went from half degree resolution to quarter degree resolution, switching from CPC gridded station data as drivers to uh, ECWMF uh, ERA5 drivers. We've done applied remote sensing. So uh, here we've mapped consumptive use of water due to irrigation uh, as a weekly and annual time series from 2001 to 2020, I think. Um, uh, and uh, so we can get a sense of, of how irrigation dynamics are changing over time, both in response to weather, but also uh, farmer behavior. It's an observed observe data set. Uh, 
And we do a lot of work looking at how we can assess impacts of large scale hazards, uh, examples being uh, COVID-19, earthquakes, droughts, economic shocks, heat waves and cold snaps in near real time using electricity data as an indicator. Um, and to do that, we have to build predictive models that account for weather, seasonality at sort of day of week and, and day of year time scales and holidays and long-term trends. We then compare the predicted uh, 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 demand to subsequent reported demand. And to do that, we have to ingest a lot of raster uh, uh, meteorological data from GDAS, ERA-5, uh, socioeconomic data, gridded population of the world, uh, and a lot of boundary data, uh, some of which is very messy for uh, grid surface area, particularly in the United States, the surface areas for the grid are, are uh, kind of incomprehensibly complex. And so you can see on the right, uh, Malaysia during COVID uh, had a big decline of over 20% uh, in electricity demand during the first wave. And if it wasn't covered, you could see there was a second wave uh, that started uh, in uh, summer 2021. So the point of that is we do a lot of work with time series geospatial data. Um, and uh, so we work on tools to help us deal with that in an efficient way. As a small company, we don't have big computing platforms. Uh, so we rely very heavily on open source data, uh, open source tools. Um, and, you know, so the obvious reason everybody thinks as well, they're free uh, and that's great, but it, the cost savings are not the driver. The, the, the key thing about the open source from our perspective is it allows us to try a number of, of uh, alternative solutions uh, without being tied to some tool that we've paid for. Um, it's flexible. Uh, we don't have complex license uh, management issues. We're working on different operating systems. Uh, it's audible and inspectable. So, you know, we, we can see precisely what the software is doing if we need to do that. Uh, in some cases we can go in, since it's open source, we say we need a new feature. We can either contract to have it done or we can go in and, and do it ourselves if we're confident. In, in our ability to do so. And from our customer's perspective, the most important thing is that we can distribute our solutions without encumbrance with software stacks that have these complex purchase and license agreements. So we can go to a customer in the US government and say, you know, here's a Docker container, you can run it off the Docker container. They can inspect the contents of the Docker container for security issues, it's not a, you know, not a big deal. Um, the open source geospatial ecosystem has a lot of uh, uh, components to it that interconnect with one another. And one of the, so th that's both a benefit and that you have this diverse set of libraries and, and, and tools, but it's also a bit of a, 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 a problem in that the interrelated, these interrelated projects provide great flexibility, but it also makes it hard uh, as it creates barriers to entry, right? You have to learn all of these tool sets before you can sort of build systems instead of, you know, picking up a nicely documented commercial package that does it end to end. So um, one of the things that we spend a lot of time working on is the geospatial data abstraction library or GDAO, which is one of the foundational open source geospatial tools. Uh, we've received some funding from NASA uh, to perform a lot of deferred maintenance on GDAL to sort of bring it up to uh, 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 current documentation and coding standards. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, GDAL is sort of the, the IO of, of geospatial data. So it supports over 250 raster formats and vector formats and a whole variety of, of forms. Um, there are command line tools as well as language bindings for just about any language you'd want to work with. Uh, and it's used everywhere. So it's embedded in Esri products, it's embedded in QGIS. So if GDAL can read your data, you can almost certainly get it in and out of your application. So um, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time highlighting some uh, uh, not very well known capabilities of GDAL. Um, and part of what we're trying to do with our deferred maintenance is to make 
these more visible and easier to use uh, through better documentation and streamlined uh, interfaces. So one of the um, not very well known capabilities of GDAL is its capability to work with virtual file systems. So you don't have to read data that's on your local computer with GDAL. You can read it from a remote location using a variety of uh, 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 interfaces from you know, uh, web interfaces to uh, S3 buckets and so forth. Uh, you can read data from within an archive or an archive at a remote location. And for a subset of, of uh, cloud optimized geospatial formats, you can read selected bands or, or layers out of the data set without having to transfer the whole thing. So sitting in our offices in Vermont, we can pull you know, band 33 from a big grib file uh, that has 100 variables in it and save ourselves a lot of data transfer time. Uh, and we're pulling it off of an S3 bucket, for example. So there are a couple of examples here. Uh, the VSI Perl is the, is the key piece. Uh, followed by a URL with you know, a web interface or VSI curl. Um, I guess two examples, uh, one's for NetCDF, uh, one's for group. Um, so those are both going to web. Uh, and so the, you know, this is just demonstrating how to do this uh, using the command line tools. We're trying to pull off temperature data for Turkey and reprojected at 30 arc second resolution. Um, so, you know, it's just a few parameters, but the key thing is here we're telling it to get it off the web. Uh, and here we're telling it to get it out of a, a, an S3 bucket. And in both cases, we're just pulling the temperature band out of this, you know, uh, complex data file that has uh, on the order of hundred variables in it. So, uh, a tool that we've developed ourselves, and I should say Dan Baston is a co-author on this, and he's the guru behind a lot of the, the, the presentation and the software, is a tool called Exact Extract. And we've run into a number of applications where we had problems where we had grid data sets that had relatively large cell size relative to the polygonal data that we were trying to summarize the raster data over. Uh, and the out-of-the-box tools use... Uh, uh, centroids or touch to uh, define which raster cells fall inside the, the polygon. So you can see with complex geometries like islands or, or uh, sort of complex reservoirs, um, those algorithms kind of fall apart. You don't get meaningful results. So what exact extract does is it actually computes the fraction of overlap and does weighted averages. The other thing that it does is it allows you to do cross tabulations and weighted, weighted uh, uh, things. So for the electricity project, the meteorological data we, we worked with uh, needed to be population weighted because land area doesn't use electricity, people use electricity. Uh, so the um, exact extract does that for us and it does it in a very highly efficient way so that we can rip through 20 years of daily meteorological data, summarizing it across a bunch of geometries um, and be able to do that off modest computing equipment from our offices in Vermont. Um, it's a C++ tool. It was originally published with R bindings because we tend to be an R dominant shop. Uh, and thanks to, again, to NASA, we now have funding to add a Python language binding to that, which I think will expand its use. But even so, it's been cited since the three years we've released it, it's been cited well over 120 times uh, in Google Scholar. So uh, it's, it's gaining quite a bit of, of traction. To give some examples, this is just a really simple uh, example. You know, so we can use exact extract to compute mean state temperature on the left, or we can look at population weighted state temperature on the right. And while the overall pattern is, is somewhat similar, you can see, you know, Idaho uh, warms up because all the population of Idaho is in the south. Uh, and you can see, um, oh, there's another state I was going to point out. Um, Georgia lightens up. Uh, so 
where the population lives is really important for a lot of our work. Um, so another application of the virtual file systems is you can you don't have to read the data verbatim. You can apply transformations to it on the fly. Uh, so the uh, gridded population of the world, which is a CDAC data set, um, is a gridded data set of population uh, with estimates every five years. But if you're trying to do something like sum the fraction of the population, sum the, the, the not the fraction, but the, the number of people in India ex experiencing extreme heat days, um, you don't wanna have five year jumps in your population data, right? Cause that's gonna create artifacts. So what you'd like to do is have a daily interpolation of the, of the population data. Um, and the, 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 interp the, 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 the interpolation algorithm is a logarithmic growth function. So it's not just simple arithmetic. Uh, so we added that functionality as an operator in the virtual file system. And we don't have to sort of keep all these daily interpolated files around on disk. We just need to call the virtual file system and it, for a given day, and it tells us what the interpolated value is. So I, I realize um, this is a little hard to read, but we, we place, uh, uh, there's a placeholder in the VFS definition for the year, which is a year in a fractional progression. Uh, the sources of the um, five-year interval data, and it computes the daily uh, interpolation on the fly. It figures out the two data sets it needs to read, does the mathematic transformation, um, and, uh, and we can use it um, interactively. So just as a sort of a simple example, you can look at, you know, gridded daily temperature. Uh, you can look at the number of people in India exposed to, I think you did 40 uh, Celsius or higher. Um, and you can see the, you know, the total population, which is this sort of nice smooth line up. Uh, and I actually looked it up. The numbers match what are reported for India population uh, over time. Uh, and what you can see is, yes, there, there, you know, there are people suffering from extreme heat in India, but the number of people is not growing as fast as the total population. So that's just sort of a quick introduction to sort of how a small 14 person shop like ours uses open source software to deal with some fairly complex time series uh, uh, environmental data analysis. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kendall Fortney. Um, I'm gonna be presenting this from the perspective of a university. Um, space to... So I am someone that is not a researcher. I am running a program office, um, but my background is all in entrepreneurship. Those are all the different companies I've worked in. Uh, I can't even tell you how many roles I've been in. Um, my background is actually fine arts. I ended up here, don't explain, I don't wanna explain why. But um, the geospatial world came to me when I started to work as a fellow for the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. It was one of the first fellowships they did. It was a fascinating experience. I learned a lot about GIS in that space and carried that into some of the programmings that I did. I got to run a, a geospatial data science conference in, in Burlington, which was a lot of fun. Um, and that kind of got me some introductions that has bled to the point where I'm doing that in some of the UVM work. So Verso is, as Bob said perfectly, the Vermont Research Open Source Program Office. Um, I think we're all trying to trip up as many acronyms as we can. Um, Verso is uh, newly funded from Sloan in the last year. We're focused on building open source communities um, in UVM and building engagement programs, educational aspects uh, in UVM and outside of UVM. So UVM is University of Vermont. Um, <clears throat> for us, you know, the definition of openness and open source is a little more vague because we're not just talking about programming. We talk about things that are like open science, open research, open work. So open is about creating, sharing, and maintaining resources together. So it's a little bit broader of a definition than just open source programming. Um, one of the one of the things that's really been interesting, and this is kind of the, the one of the reasons that I, I think it's interesting to be here, is I ended up getting funding to create an open source connector, basically a meetup um, in the community around open source, partially because I was talking to students, they kept asking me questions about QGIS, 
Um, and that's not an easy program to work with unless you know it really well. And they're asking for help. And I'm like, honestly, I can get you a quarter of the way there. But I, was like, but I know there are people in this community that actually know their stuff. So I talked to people at Champlain College, another local um, you know, um, educational system here, and we worked together to actually create this as a joint thing between Champlain and UVM to bring students from both to each other's campuses and bring in the local community and have a community events. So we are going to be starting in the fall once the students are back because they're not here. Um, but it's a really interesting thing. It's, I, th I think it's going to bring some connections that are useful for students and, and the community, but also have us all talk about some of these things because some of these programs are really hard to use. We all, it's a pretty small town. I don't know if you've noticed, it's only about 60,000. So like, you know, the number of people that even do that is really small. So to bring those people together to help each other is just, it's very useful. One of the things I've also been able to working on is the OpenGIS data portal. Um, this was something that was done in ArcGIS in the community section through the um, UVM Spatial Labs. I'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, but it was an interesting question of like, if we want to talk about what open data is out, um, building spaces for UVM to host GIS. And there's also another one I'm working on this non-GIS data um, because we produce a lot of it. Um, what was interesting is, you know, I got into the ArcGIS account for UVM and I was like, there's like 14,000 data sets in here. And then I looked at it and I'm like, oh, most of these are student data sets that we probably don't want to publish. So this became a really interesting question of like, hey, you know, we put this up, we have a, a rough set of, like, I think like 300 data sets in there. But the question that we've been talking about a lot, and the reason this is not like something we publish publicly a lot, is that how do we curate this? How do you find what needs to be in there? What the quality standards needs to meet? What problems is trying to solve? How do we think about that? Who maintains that? All that fun stuff of data repositories. How do you maintain it? Um, inside of the University of Vermont, there's a lot of different use of geospatial tools. Um, some of those things I know about, some of them I don't. Um, universities are fairly distributed and siloed in all the different ways, so I may not know about some of the projects that are out there. Um, there is an ArcGIS account that's used, so that's obviously proprietary stuff, but there's also a lot of research that's using R, Python, using QGIS, using all those things that you know um, to do some of that work. Um, a lot of that, again, is like, it's not like they sign up and put it in one central place. It's not like a company where you kind of know the, the the programs that are in use, it's so distributed that I kind of have to search through the darkness and be like, hey, what are you working on? Um, and only year in, I'm just barely starting to scratch the surface. <clears throat> um, the Vermont Advanced Computing Core is a new uh, supercomputer that we built at UVM. And that's kind of an interesting place where we have a lot of compute power. We can start playing with some of the geospatial things that we're going to, we're thinking about doing. But that's still also fairly new. So my presentation changed a lot in the last week. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's been going on. I'm gonna show you some of the work that our spatial teams are doing at UVM and talk about how that translates to openness as we're going through that. Um, this is down, downtown Montpelier. Um, again, I'm some, I'm, how many of you are out of state actually? Okay, so all, almost all of you. So a lot of this you're not gonna have seen flying in. There's, there's probably a little chance you would have seen it. So I'm gonna show you some pictures from the space and kind of talk about the response and what we were doing about it. Um, this was taken by the UVM Spatial Lab, their, um, their drone program. Um, originally, I was going to go into more about like technical aspects of it, but I was like, you know, I feel like this is more pressing to talk about what this, how we react to things that are happening in, in real time with openness. Um, this is a great map. This is rainfall in, in like what a single day. The peak was nine um, inches. Uh, and for a lot of the state, you know, that was over mountains. So it hits the mountains and sheds into all the waterways. Um, there was an earlier presentation that kind of showed like all the waterways is where all the towns are. They build towns along rivers. Actually, fascinating fact, the term flatlander, um, which is something you occasionally hear, was comes from the 1700s and it was about anyone that built in the valleys because everyone in that time period built on the mountains because they're like, we can't control the floods. Um, this happened, you can see at the bottom, it was like a, within a single day, the waters in Montpelier jumped, what, like almost 15 feet. Um, I was here during Irene. It was kind of crazy to see what happened there. And, and some of this has actually talked a lot of that. And this is I don't know, it's fascinating. It's an unnamed storm, right? It's kind of that crazy part of it. Um, satellite imagery wasn't useful at that time because you have clouds, you can't see it. So it became a question of what was on the ground. So the Spatial Analysis Lab, um, specifically the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Team, UAS, um, is part of, run by Jarleth O'Neill Dunn. Um, they have, they're part of the Rubenstein School and they, they run these drones and they do it for research purposes. So um, I initially met these guys when I was a fellow at the BCGI when they were doing surveys with drones on CO2 emissions from fruit and fertilizers in fields, which was kind of fascinating. Um, coming back to this point, though, is that, you know, they've advanced their gear quite a bit. They're using really intense drones that do really good imagery. Um, they have some really done um, some really cool photogrammetry. 
I think I'm saying that right. I never say that right. But doing that kind of work as well, just for part of the work that they're doing. But in this case, this team was deployed as an early response to this. Um, there are three teams. They had 12 missions. And the, they got notifications. That's ours. Um, and within about, what, 10 hours, they were actually already pr producing data um, that we could be used, which was super important because the floods are coming in. We had limited resources to understand it. It's not easy to get around this state. There's a lot of mountains. So like on the ground data is hard to collect. So in reality, you know, we have the initial activation on, on the, the Monday and by Tuesday, they're doing all the flights and they are already building the, the data viewer on the 12th. Um, being part of UVM, I got some of the email updates and I got to see that viewer at the very beginning. And it was the first data that I saw that will actually show some of the impact. Um, this is a screenshot of the data viewer. You can see um, the dots are actually pictures. This is much later. So like this has a lot more imagery than initially had, but pictures um, that were, are the, the, the dots. And then if you zoom in, you'll be able to see, and I'll show it to you, I think here, um, the setup, the imagery they've done directly over it. So this was done in conjunction with the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. They put this up very quickly in ArcGIS. Um, and this is kind of the question of like open and closed, right? Like the, it's using ArcGIS, which is a, you know, a system that has its closeness. And also what they were doing was putting data openly in a place where there was no data. Like we didn't have anything like this. It was vital to the, the on the ground responders and to FEMA to understand what was actually happening. Um, and it wasn't until a couple of days later, like the Civil Air Patrol get up there and do some shots because you know, gotta wait for the storm to pass. Um, and to see what some of the impact would be. Um, search and rescue is a big part of this. Luckily, I think we only had one death. I think it's been surprising given the, the way the water rose, but that information and how they took the satellite imagery into places for, or the um, drone imagery and used that for those understandings of what was being impacted was super vital. I, I have the joy of being able to say that we, we kicked some butt on this one and it's pretty cool. Um, it's unfortunately a very hard incident and it's gonna do a lot of damage to Vermont. Um, you can see here that here's drone passes. So they're doing drone passes um, over. This is, yeah, Montpelier. So like the state house is, is actually, I'm going to point. Um, so having this information, kind of told them where they could access. A lot of roads were closed. So you had to understand where you could actually get vehicles across to yield responses um, and getting that back as fast as they could um, to have it updated. Not quite real time, but pretty close. Um, and having these teams distributed across the entire state. Uh, here are some of the images from that. So I'll show you a couple. We'll go through them quickly. Uh, I don't need to like sit there and stare at them for too long, but the water was kind of crazy. I, I live in North Burlington. I went down to the dam and saw water coming over the dam. The dam survived, which was awesome, but it was kind of insane to watch that happen. A lot of these areas will take a long time to repair, um, and some of those areas are still inaccessible. This is a, a railroad that the entire part underneath got wiped out and it's like hanging hundred feet in the air, um, which is kind of the insane thing, like replacing that earth to then rebuild that infrastructure to then move trains. Uh, a lot of the Amtrak services were cut off when we had this because um, this wasn't the only place that trains were actually cut off. Again, like getting this data back out to people so they know it was kind of vital. Um, they lost one drone in this entire process. Those drones are not cheap, but still they're like equipment, not people, right? We're not, we're not putting people at risk to take this information in. At this time, too, I've done some open street mapping in the past. Um, I brought together a team of people, uh, not people that I know, people in the public, to do some open street mapping. Now, the state of Vermont has really good GIS data, and the data they're going to use to do a lot of their work is coming out of their own shop. But open street maps is useful for anyone who's going to be analyzing data. And this is all not about placing, hey, this is where the flood is. This is about saying, these are where buildings were, right? We're taking satellite imagery and putting in there building flip footprints. So when you go back and you put your flood data on top of it, you kind of see what's going away. Um, we got together 27 people <clears throat> within with about a 12 hours notice. Um, I created a page so they could kind of manage this. There were two tasks we got created with OpenStreetMaps. Uh, I talked to them on Slack, got them to put up some tasks um, an incredible speed. And then we did a two hour meetup, virtual meetup. Um, and then we had, like, this is an example. This is one of the tasks. This was mapping buildings. Anything that's white hasn't been mapped yet. The blue and the dark, dark green is kind of that process of putting in data then validating it. And the focus was like major metropolitan centers, Montpelier, um, Barrie, they, they're pretty well mapped, but you get to the regions that are around it. And all that water is coming down from the mountains and hitting those spots. Um, it was useful to have some information in there as well. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. You're, you're, I don't know how many, how many of you have done open street mapping? 
couple of you. Okay, cool. So it's it's so easy to do. It's almost meditative sometimes. Um, and it's interesting, like there's different levels. We had a, a beginning task because most of us were beginners. Um, my rating is still a beginner. And there were intermediate tasks dealing with waterways and roads. Um, so there's kind of two levels of approaching it. The goal too is I've done this in the past. It disappeared for a while. We're trying to bring that back and create a team that's a little more trained that can validate the data, that can do this quicker. Most of these are usually done internationally. Um, places where they don't have good GIS, here we have pretty good GIS, but still there's elements we can improve it. So um, in reality, like if we get this, bring this back, the goal is to have a bunch of people that can actually do this on a fly for an emergency. Um, I tried to do it during the Turkish earthquake actually. Um, and we got a little bit of that done personally, but not as a large group. So it's kind of like trying to build that ecosystem but adding data in the open space. And we did, uh, this was, I think this is two days ago. So I don't know what the stats are currently, but we did like 4,000 buildings in this one case. There was a, over almost 5,000 edits and there are 43 mappers that did it. And 75% of them were new. I've never done it before. So a little bit about the University of Vermont, like where we're trying to go with this, the open source connector we're gonna be launching in the fall, bringing in GIS speakers as part of that because I know different people in that space and it's good to have those voices come in to talk about what open GIS is versus just open source in general. Um, and one of the aspects of doing going through an event like the, the flooding is kind of identifying areas where openness could be useful, open source project software can help support questions and problems around local road closures. So interestingly, like we have a we have a 501 that helps us identify major road closures, but like local ones are run by the municipalities. So how you actually get that information, aggregate it to let people know how to get out of where they are is really relevant. So trying to think about that ecosystem or high water mapping where people will do the higher grounds and like, well, where is higher ground? What's safe? So thinking about those aspects of working with state governments to kind of identify some of these things and build some of this stuff out. This is a very beginning stage. Like we don't know what that's going to look like yet. Um, and then kind of documenting the VAX, um, the supercomputers, GIS resources, and supporting um, open source adoption inside of UVM. And lastly, finding community partners and applied research opportunities inside of Vermont to kind of grow some of these partnerships and kind of identify these things. I think a lot of the reality is like open research and open source is open source software has done a lot at UVM, often informally by people just trying to figure out problems and building networks that allow them to identify each other and understand that someone else is working on the same problem and might have better ideas um, is really relevant. And bringing community members like Tom into those spaces where who have a, like decades of experience to be like, hey, these are tools you can use as well is kind of a vital part of that. Exposure is hard and finding ways to bring that into the university is kind of vital. And that is my information if you need it. Thank you. Do I need to put the whole arrow on the top right? Double arrow. You know where it's <laughs> done. I mean, never tried to present for the PDF. So this thing. Oh, yeah. Two sided arrow. So how do I? Is it arrow? Just uh, arrow key. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm Ryan uh, Berkheimer, and uh, thanks, Tom, for inviting me to this session. Um, some of the things I think will be relevant, especially the GDAL stuff, is really interesting. Um, so I'm here to offer some perspectives um, from NOAA and CEI on open source and open science enablement in geospatial information access. Um, so sharing a little bit on what we are working toward right now. Um, which is a fair question. Um, at, at NOAA and CEI, we're working to develop the next generation archive system. And um, this archive system is in, in, intended to unlock in, some new insights in NOAA data, um, breaking down stovepipes. So um, we're, we're using some very well understood and traditional concepts from the OAIS information model, taking those and then using that as a reference model to build this new enterprise knowledge graph. And, um, you know, so we have things, you know, archival information units, which represent identity. So we can define any concept of interest in terms of an AIU. We can then define these different spaces called um, archival information collections, 
which are sort of like context transformation spaces. And we can then combine our concepts into, uh, into these AICs. And then we can disseminate these things out to, to different um, endpoints. We can send, it, send a response back, we can ship it to, to NASA, um, we can you know, send an email notification. And really importantly, we're capturing all this, so we're defining all this sort of stuff in terms of isolated processes and then you know, through an API, and all this becomes data. It becomes a process definition. It's held in the knowledge graph. And then we, we pump data through it um, to produce records. Um, and, and those are all held in the knowledge graph. So um, you know, we're, we're trying to work towards democratized system access. Um, so you know, full API exposure to a pure information model or, or core data model. So you know, process is data, everything is data. You know, the, the information and knowledge that I'm shipping to, an, to a, a processor, to a GDAL library, whatever, this is all captured in data. And, um, you know, we can do a lot of interesting things with this. Um, ultimately, what, you know, what we would like to work toward is, you know, shared explicit um, wisdom and, and decisions. Um, and, you know, th that's probably part of a different talk. But um, so here's a little breakdown um, of, of sort of, you know, what we can envision these AIUs and AICs and, and dip spaces for, and who might be using these. So, you know, what, what I'm saying is an AIU is a task in some process, and an AIU runs some user, user business logic and then produces some pattern information. So at an AIU, we're, we're patterning concepts. In AICs, which are green here, we're actually patterning context transformations or expressions of things. And in, in the far right, we're, we're patterning um, deliveries to endpoints. And um, within these, you can see I've kind of called out, you know, here's a, here's a library or some business logic. Here's a source of, in, of, of, um, of capability that we want to use. And, and that's what we're trying to do. So we could compose processes with these different things, right? A GDAL library, OGC EDR API, um, Metaflow, MLflow, Hugging Face, Ray, and into these processes, into these process chains, define this as a, as a data process, and then just run these. And, and we can you know, compose really interesting things this way. Um, here, here's a notional vision of a ConOps um, for use of the system at an enterprise level. Um, so in the middle, you can see we have, you know, this process is data set um, where we're passing in you know, standard uh, messages. We're running through these predefined things to spit out metadata at a record level, holding all this metadata as denormalized JSON LD files, you know, purely semantically interoperable RDF stuff um, in a metadata bucket, which is, you know, dynamically prefixed. So we have, you know, sort of in, um, endless scale if we needed to in, in uh, reads and writes. And then we're putting data and accessing data bucket. And we have all these interfaces. So we have all these points of interoperability. We can, we can ship data, you know, to places that live outside of the, the, the archive system and the framework, you know, and, and in, on the top we have users, data managers, scientists, physical scientists, operators who are plugging in, you know, models. Um, things that we that we can compose into these into these processes. They're use, they're they're providing task user business logic via CI/CD, and then composing these into these processes, and then making requests on these processes. And I, I hope this kind of draws the the inference that this is where you know the GDAL stuff, and and sort of the end user too, um, sort of that Kendall presenter sort of rolls into to one. So how are we working towards this? Um, a little bit more of a jump in, but um, you know, knowledge interoperability um, requires um, you know shared reference model. So we're we're taking this tech that was outlined um, in 2002, um, sort of a modified version of it. But um, you know, Thomas Beale came out with this archetypes for um, future-proof information systems and created an ISO standard for for the health record space. And what it does is say, take a reference model, a really generic one. It has to have recursive structure. You have to be able to define anything, treat it as building blocks, and then compose um, user processes or user patterns out of these. So now we have this level of interoperability at a semantic level. Um, and then you know, using other different types of um, in interoperability, different levels, different aspects of it, um, to let all this data flow through and be defined and all this stuff. Um, so everybody can use it. We can we can get as much use as possible, which you know is the idea. 
um, without worrying so much about pre-agreements and pre-alignments. And let's apply evolutionary governance. And let's say, you know, okay, you are using these ontologies. You're using Envo. You're using this. You know, I see that. You know, let's align. And then, you know, what what pieces of data do I want? And we want to enable expression, right? And, and process kind of ties this together by treating it as a digital thread. And this concept kind of comes from um, digital twins. But, you know, we want to have this root cause tracing ability, right? This is part of open science. Um, if I create a record and I do a lot of processing on it and ship it somewhere, somebody says, well, that's great. Now I have this data set. But what what all happened to it? What can I do with it? How does it fit into the network? Well, process is used for that purpose, right? We can thread um, records through all these transformations, all these deliveries. And, and you know, this is, this is really, you know, I'm glad to see this is happening in, this, in the domain that we're working towards these workflows. But what this does is go a step further and say, let's actually just treat that as data, right? Let's treat processes itself as a data. And why are we working towards this? Um, we'd like to enable, um, you know, digital twins and federated digital twins. And, um, the, you know, I'm doing a talk tomorrow on, on Geoverse enablement. So maybe talk a little bit more there. But, um, you know, we've been working a lot with our partners at different agencies at NSF um, to, to develop this vision for a federated digital twins um, ecosystem. And, and there are a lot of groups, um, really, really great groups working on this. Um, but but what we're trying to do is build that foundation, right? It's a step change towards some, you know, future, future state. Um, and I really like this diagram that was pulled from a presentation from a winter meeting um, that um, actually then summarizes a statement by Terry McConnell at, at, the, um, at the, um, the Ditto conference, sparkly fountains need robust plumbing systems. So all these user applications Right, um, you know, we need to build build something. You know, what is it? Something. Um, we also want to enable intrinsic open science. So, you know, one of the things from the plenary that we heard um, in Slido was, you know, give me some in incentive. You know, I, you could also say, what, you know, lower the barrier of you of doing open science. So we're taking that kind of tack. We're lowering the barrier by exposing all this. You know, processes data. We can wrap a really a simple API around it, and now you know just just write as much as you can, express as much as you can of your process um, into these tasks, right? You can use just like an, an AIU task to a dip task, but the more expression you get out of it, you know, the more we're exposing for, for reuse, um, which is, you know, sort of what we'd like to, you know, you know, see where the, see the community move, to, move toward. Um, we also want to support this, this idea of creating a, a, knowledge graph of graphs that NSF is working on now it's part of the the open knowledge network and and some of you here may have been part of this proto OKN this is the third phase um, we've just finished reviews and are looking towards awards but this is essentially trying to create the next generation um, internet right a, a more public a more trustable public internet and um, and all these organizations are participating in this um, into developing all these knowledge graphs and then looking at how, how to combine them and then looking at how to educate uh, on these knowledge graphs. So I think I covered a lot of what we want to enable, but you know, what do we want to enable when we have all this data together? Um, you know, we can enable things like foundational models, right? Um, we can enable NOAA, you know, government foundational models, participatory, participatory foundation models where we can, we can use the community to build these foundation models. Um, you know, we'd also like to enable easier access and, and you know, leverage some of the new innovations and capabilities for, for lowering the access to you know, underserved communities and through integration with some of these new tools in a trustable way. You know, as an authoritative rep repository, we have to make sure the data we're, we're saying this is accurate is accurate. These tools have lots of issues with that, but with knowledge graphs, we can add some guardrails. And we would like to enable, um, you know, as governance improves, guardrails are understood, um, full democratic use, right? So we would like to enable this for participation by every scientist at NOAA to, to use, to, to reuse things, to submit things, to share um, what they're working on. 
um, using different tools and use RDF as, as that um, semantic integration layer, expose it all as an API, and then let people write um, interfaces along over it. And I really like this diagram. I, you know, I share it all the time um, that uh, Ken Casey put together, but this is kind of, um, I, I love this because it simplifies. It doesn't call out um, private, you know, private sector via NSF. So imagine that there is private sector. Everybody's represented here. But you know, if we can, if we can federate sort of this concept of process, right, and interoperability, um, you know, things don't have to match exactly, right? But um, you know, process is fundamental. So fuzzy process interoperability, I think, you know, is enough. But I think if we all sort of take this tact, we can enable sort of this graph of graphs, this, you know, this process graph of graphs and, and really open up um, open science. And that's it. Thanks. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I usually have to put this a little bit lower. Better? Okay. Um, so since Bob didn't get to introduce me, really, since I lame and didn't send my bio, I'm going to talk a bit about my background. I used to have the dream job of every seven-year-old boy. I was a paleontologist, and I was working on a description of a fossil beetle. That was my specialty, and I thought... I'd been hearing a lot about climate change. I was a new mom. I thought, what does this matter? How is describing this fossil beetle going to change the future for my children? And it wasn't. Um, and so I got into GIS and remote sensing. And along the way, I actually learned that fossil beetles do have a role and can be used with remotely sensed data to do some eco forecasting and predict where insects, which um, are going extinct at alarming rates, might move to during climate change and how they might react to climate change. Um, and I could see the data to do this research, but I couldn't do the research because I didn't know how I could download the data, but then what? Um, and so that's why I am in this role now, why I came to ESDIS to work with the DAX, and why my new position as the um, science data operations manager, where I oversee the DAX and I'm helping them evolve towards a user-friendly, expanded user-friendly future, um, is, I guess, my dream job. Um, once I figure out how to do it and <laughs> it becomes a little less stressful and I you know, adjust to the workload. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is some of the uses of open source geospatial software and uh, tools that we have at ESDIS to help make science easier for those non-experts, people who might wanna use it for um, a non-standard use maybe or, um, and um, because I am not really an expert in geospatial tools and uh, technology, I also brought some backups. So I hope my backup's here. <laughs> so, um, so earlier today, we did some talking about uh, open science and someone said, you're using a lot of acronyms. I don't know what ESDIS is. I don't know what a DAC is. So I'm just gonna start out with, ESDIS is NASA's Earth Science Data and Information System. Um, we are responsible for processing, archiving, and distributing Earth science data that NASA produces. And we do this through our DACs and our SIPs. Um, we have 12 SIPs, which are not on here. Um, the SIPs are the Science Investigated Lead Processing Systems, and they work with the science teams to process level zero data into standard products. And then we have 12 DACs, which are shown here. Um, these provide open source tools to facilitate the processing, archiving, and distrib distribution of NASA's Earth science data. Um, they work to ensure that 
scientists and the public have access to the data to enable the study of the Earth from space and help meet some of the challenges of climate change. Um, and they collect metrics um, and user satisfaction data to help adjust services and continue improving. Um, so I think everybody knows NASA studies the Earth, um, but these are just uh, our active missions right now. And um, the missions that are coming soon are in orange. Um, so the operating missions are the ones in green and the extended ones are in blue. Um, and all this adds up to a growing amount of data. And that's great because this data is used in all kinds of scientific research and it can provide information to help us solve some of the environmental and policy problems that drove me to change career paths. But all this means we've got to connect people to that data because you can't do science if you can't use the data, right? Um, so our portal to the data is Earth Data. It allows open access to all our data holdings um, and to free open source tools that make them easier to use. Um, through the Earth Data website, you yeah, it's more than just the data. There's also data recipes, data tools, there's webinars and tutorials, GIS tools, and a whole lot more. Um, it could be better organized, but that's something for the future. But that's that's the gateway, really, for the person who is not used to NASA data. Two of the major components are Earth Data Search and Worldview. Um, Earth Data Search is our search tool. It allows the user to search more than 9,000 data collections um, on a search term of their choice. So they can enter a search term in the box or they can use a keyword platform instruments, the organization that collected the data. We also have some NOAA data. We have some USGS data, um, some NSF data, and um, or the processing level latency. So you can choose what is important for your research and find that data. Um, you can also search on other portals like the above portal or DAX, you can do a DAX specific search. Um, Worldview is probably the most basic. Um, it lets users display imagery from a about a thousand different imagery layers, and then they can decide if they want to download the data. There's Worldview Snapshot, and this picture down here I made very quickly of the code red air quality in DC on June 29th. Um, and I recently, on, we have a, as to Slack, I read a post from someone who showed his grandmother the smoke on Worldview. And she started using Worldview and taught her friends. So there was this group of 80 year old women using Worldview to look at the earth. So I, very accessible, right? Um, maybe my mom could learn. Uh, but just, you know, looking and downloading data isn't enough. People need to be able to use that data and we wanna help with that. Uh, many people use GIS systems to work with data. So right now we are working on Earth Data GIS or EGIS. It is a work in progress. Um, various data services, maps, apps, and um, tools will be available through Aegis, which will be a centralized resource for distributing cloud-native GIS-ready NASA Earth observation data. It will provide a consistent user experience and um, allow resource discovery through platforms like ArcGIS um, and image services that are commonly used and people can, um, you know, there'll be a, right now there's three pages of, uh, of, uh, of NASA data sets. Um, there will be many more that users can access and then put into QGIS or their Jupyter notebook. Um, so that's Aegis. Um, GIS doesn't work for everything. I mean, that's why I couldn't do the research that I wanted to do. Um, so we also have tools that are built for certain types of data or communities of users. Uh, many of these are developed by our DAX or in collaboration with the DAX. So Open Altimetry is a platform for the discovery and visualization and access of laser altimeter data. It was originally developed as an access project uh, funded by NASA's ESDS. 
um, where the Scripps Institute of Technologies, the San Diego Supercomputers Center, and NSIDC DAC worked together um, on this. And the goal was to visualize ISAT data, and then it was later expanded to include ISAT2 data. Its current home is now at openaltimetry.org, but it is in the process of being moved to Earth data, where in the future it will be available to work with additional types of altimetry data. Um, so that's other tools that are developed at the DAX. There's a lot of them. Um, Hype, I did not get a picture of, but it's a service for processing synthetic aperture radar data um, that addresses many of the common issues for SAR data users. Um, appears right there at LPDAC. The is the application for extracting and exploring analysis ready samples, and it enables LPDAC users to quickly and efficiently subset data spatially and temporally and by layers. Um, the second, the middle picture on the top is Giovanni. It's a web application that produces a simple, intuitive way to visualize and analyze and access Earth science remote sensing data without having to download the data. Um, and SOTO is a PODAX tool, the state of the ocean, um, which is an interactive web-based visualization tool that provides access to satellite-derived oceanic products um, of interest to the oceanographic community. And then we have on the bottom, the side, the Airborne Data Visualizer. It's a tool for measuring in situ measure or for displaying in situ measurements from airborne missions. You can look at one mission or multiple missions. And then the final picture uh, is the Lightning Dashboard at GHRC. And these are just a few that I was able to grab pictures of. Um, so we do have a lot of these user community specific tools. Um, You've probably heard that the DACs are moving their data into the Earth Data Cloud. Um, since I was not able to make my own slides, I had to borrow slides um, just in order to, because of the NASA slide approval process. So this has a lot more information than I needed, but the point is that our data is moving to the cloud and that's going to enable new opportunities. Um, there's many reasons for this. One is that large data volume that I showed you earlier, but another is providing all our users with equal access to high performing compute, high performance computing adjacent to the data without having to rely on being at a major research institution with an HPC environment. So in that way, it does enable open science. Um, the cloud enables this for everyone without having to download data. Um, so I mean, it's one thing to put the data in the cloud, it's another to have the data users, uh, our data users access it and use it. Um, the NASA OpenScapes project is was a three-year project to support scientists using our data from um, the DACs as they migrate workflows to the cloud. Um, they had a scalable teaching framework and um, worked with at least seven DACs, may have been more. Um, and some of the things they did was do cloud hackathons and um, the Earth Data Cloud Cookbook, I think was a major accomplishment. It provides support for scientific researchers um, as they migrate their data to the cloud and um, a lot of resources for how to do it. Um, so, and then uh, another resource for cloud users is Open SAR Lab. It's an ecosystem of open source tools for data analysis that um, Open Science Lab, it used to be Open SAR Lab. Um, in a Jupyter Lab environment, um, it offers free limited access to cloud hosted Jupyter Hubs, um, which is great for classroom settings and for collaborations that require large data sets and repeatability. Um, so on the bottom, it says similar efforts across NASA include the cloud playground, which is um, also a cloud environment for users to get used to the cloud. It's in development now. Um, and then VEDA, which Alexi can tell us all about. Um, 
I don't have a slide about. So these are just some of the resources um, that we have now. There are more being developed in the future. Um, I think we're looking towards, as we look towards open science and what it means for new communities and multidisciplinary communities to be able to use our data. And um, that's what I got. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay, uh, we don't really have a setup for the presenters to answer questions, but imagine that virtually. <laughs> um, uh, we have not quite the full half hour, but uh, time for questions and maybe some comments. This was, I think, a little wider range of uh, scales and topics than I personally was expecting, but I think we've covered a lot of interesting issues related to how these um, tools are starting to evolve and how they hopefully may be uh, uh, advantageous for, you know, users as, as they develop. So questions, there's a mic here, so people on Zoom can go ahead. Let me check Zoom. Is this on? Okay. I actually have a question for you, Sarah. So now you've been here a while. If you needed to do that project you were trying to do before with that data, do you think you'd be able to do it now? Or is that like not the good question to ask? You would know where to go for help. Okay. Well, that's also good. That's good. I have a question for you. <laughs> so you had that slide where you talked about satellite imagery and it was just a fuzzy image because of the clouds. But there's no radar synthetic aperture radar imagery at your disposal for that because it can see through cloud <laughs> so as someone that wasn't on the ground with jarleth and that team i was given that slide by him i don't know what other things were accessible at that time well next time next time right <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you have to know about, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It keeps on changing and yeah, the, the ability to like, these kind of things teach us quickly what things we want to spool up when we have these again. Um, when our reading happened, man, I don't even know how long it was, like five years ago, right? Um, I, there were communities cut off and the response to that was fairly new. There were things that we learned from that, that we used this time. Um, Jarleth had actually been doing training with the different response teams. So when it came time to do this, they actually had a clue what to do. It wasn't the first time we worked together. So I think there's aspects of that we have to keep refining, um, and practice makes perfect. And hopefully we have to do a lot of these, but we'll see. Yeah. Right. I have a question for you as well about um, the OpenJS hub that you were talking about. What's the scope of that for? Is it GIS projects that, is it every GIS uh, product that winds up getting produced at University of Vermont? Is it across the state? Is it across, like what's the actual scope of what's going to be available through that? That is such a good question. Um, so I think when we put it together initially, um, we threw a bunch of stuff into it and we're like, wait a minute, that's not right. So I pulled a bunch of things out and that question is when we don't have a good answer for yet. Um, I think it's kind of also identifying where the needs are, where they're not being met. Um, I imagine, you know, it's going to be beyond Vermont data because a lot of our researchers work outside of Vermont. So I think there's going to be data that's going to be outside of the, the jurisdiction of Vermont. However, defining this criteria is something that we're still kind of trying to understand, especially um, professors have a lot of time. They don't do anything else. So, you know, they can sit there and think about it. Um, no, they're, they're really busy. And like the time to sit there and think deeply about this is very difficult. Um, and I've been working with them when, when we can, but we keep having these things that they have to respond to. So it makes it a little more difficult. I think the, the question too is like UVM is not a massive university. So where are we you know, unique or capable of supporting something that's really relevant to other communities that will use it? Because if we put it out there, no one uses it. 
okay, that's not awesome. Like what are, where are actual needs for this stuff? Like I'd rather have them use it and give us feedback and understand what that is. I mean, the whole point of open source is build communities. There's no community. You're talking to yourself. Yeah, and please do identify yourself. Sure, Josh Lieberman from the Open Geospatial Consortium. So I'm really interested in this idea of an open source geospatial ecosystem, but there are these great perspectives from academia and for government, and then some, I would say, often outliers from commerce. But most of my experience with open source and industry is make a list of all of the live open source libraries so we'll know how bad our liability exposure is. So this is the reason why Apache Foundation exists, why OSGEO exists. This is why in some cases, government open source can be valuable. But I think as you're looking at this ecosystem, uh, how do you address that challenge of, you know, so many users and contributors are going to be barred by liability concerns. I won't be able to. Um, yeah, if you, uh, let me take a stab. And, you know, I don't think we, in, in this limited panel and who we could get to come to Burlington, really got all the key stakeholders. And, you know, I'm glad you're raising this because it is it is a organizational or you know institutional set of issues um you know we as a as a nasa contractor we more or less uh, a while back the same week you know we were uh being engaged in the discussion about open source science you know nasa has a big priority on it and the same week we get a memo from the um uh you know the chief uh, information officer of nasa saying you have to uh, secure your software supply chains and know that all the coders that uh, all the code that is you're incorporating in your system passed NIST standards the national institute for uh, standards and technology which you know is not going to be something that comes naturally out of the open source community so how, how do you reconcile these conflicting uh needs you know security is definitely and uh is definitely a key need uh you can't ignore it uh with the idea of doing open source and i don't think we know yet obviously how to do that reconciliation and in what framework and, and of course if it's all done piecemeal, um, uh, it's also not going to happen unless you have this larger view of uh, not only what can be done, but what can be done together and over a longer period so it's more sustainable. So, you know, I don't think we're uh, obviously going to solve that here, but I do think it's part of the, you know, larger set of issues that will have to be addressed at some level. Tom, did you want to? Yeah, so I, as Bob mentioned, you know, and I, I probably should have, iScientist does a fair amount of work in the national security space. Did you turn that on? I think you just need to hold the yeah, okay. so, no, uh, I sign. Oh, there's a threat. Yeah, it's fine. So we do a fair amount of work in the national security space. And when we, you know, at least in that world, the mindset has changed. 180 degrees. So when we started working in that world, commercial, so no R, MATLAB. Um, and now that world is entirely bought into open source uh, and they've dealt with the crossover issues and the vetting issues. And so I think, you know, I don't wanna go into a lot of detail in part because I don't know it all, but in part because I don't know what they want to reveal, but there's a lot, there are a lot of lessons to be learned about how they approached uh, open source and, you know, in an arena where they're clearly very concerned about supply chains. And I will say, you know, the, the big problems that they've had have not been with open source. 
it's been with commercial software. So uh, <laughs> move it is the big current example. Cloud, was it Cloudflare? Uh, uh, the, the network management system that was breached. Um, so the the um, there's myth and reality, and and sorting those things out uh, is important. And I think in a lot of ways the national security world in the U.S. has has done that. Now the one thing that they probably don't realize is that a lot of the geospatial open source comes out of Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, so one way to get control over the open source supply chain is to fund it. And we're beginning to see that now with efforts out of uh, NASA and others. So I, that was not exactly my question. I, 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 I appreciate that. And I appreciate the enlightened view that obscurity is not security. But what I was referring to actually was really being able to have industry as a partner because of their liability concerns and uh, having spent days and days documenting you know libraries so that the lawyers can decide okay is there somebody we can sue for each one uh does this come up when a, a university tries to make open source software that's been developed by its community available publicly Um, so li liability is a interesting issue. Uh, sort of, I have a hat working on open open data licensing, and uh, you know, one of the issues that made uh, Creative Commons uh, more palatable for open data was that in version four of the international buy license that most people now use, there was uh, addition of liability language that helps protect the, uh, you know, the, the copyright holder who's giving away rights uh, uh, or opening up rights. And I think that same set of issues hasn't fully been vetted, obviously, with the software licensing community. So, so that is a very specific issue that, uh, you know, is interesting. It's real, this may be a, an aside, the, um, uh, you know, one of the things that the there's a competing session that the ESIP disaster lifecycle cluster is running right now. Um, but w one of the things I learned working with that group is that uh, uh, liability is this funny thing. The, the industry likes to pay for inputs. They're, they're concerned about open public uh sources that are not like a government agency because when you pay for it you build in the contract builds in exactly the liability relationships if somebody doesn't perform they don't get paid or they get sued or whatever and with uh you know ESIP promoting open sources that aren't necessarily uh, that they don't know much about they don't trust it because they are not they don't have that uh relationship that they can you know pass up the chain or whatever right so i do think that's an important issue for us to think about and whether a more unified structure i mean almost like the the uh, kind of um, overall architecture supports the that there is uh you know uh quality control and uh, authentication and, and um, traceability of all the pieces so that when people use these systems, even though they're not contracted for it, that there's a uh, whatever community of trust behind it. And I think that's one of the issues that will have to come out, right? So we, Kendall, we, you're gonna reply also, I think. I think it's a really interesting question because having been on both sides of industry and inside of academia at this point, academia is much newer to me. It's a whole space to explore. Translating research into businesses or working with business partners to translate research into something they're going to use. Um, 
is a place where I'm finding an interesting inter intersection because sometimes that research can turn into commercial projects where, hey, this work is proprietary. We're not going to tell it out loud. We're going to do this thing and then we're going to go from there. But there's also re researchers that I'm talking to and I'm like, the work they're trying to do. And I'm like, you know, the question though is, what impact do you want to have? How long do you want it to, how soon do you want it to have it in? And those questions of how much they're willing to give up control over some of those things in order to initiate impact or to build community or to like, like I've had a couple of conversations with private companies that are asking about like, hey, if we the research private companies are like, what if we open source some of our, our pieces to both put it out there in the public, demonstrate it, build community, develop customers and also show value and have other things that are not. So I'm kind of intrigued by the this, this hybrid mix of those things too, when it comes, there's some liability and there's some not, and there's some things you give up and some things you keep um, that I think <clears throat> is not clear what that actually looks like, what the cost benefit analysis, that kind of thing is in the business world. Um, and, you know, part of the advantage that we had is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, UVM is we had an ocean um, group that was exploring open source ecosystem as research projects or trying to understand how open source ecosystems work. And we've been talking a lot about how we can think about the business side of that as well, of how open source ecosystems work inside of that. I've been in companies where we dealt with the liability of open source. Um, it was kind of a last minute thing. And we're kind of like, oh, wow, that's actually a problem. We have to re refactor this stuff. Um, and I think even people where they're paid to do it don't necessarily do it right. So it's like, you know, even that exchange of money doesn't mean the liability is actually covered. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that interplay and it's messy. It's a messy system at best. Um, but I think there's also, it's a fairly new system. There's a lot of opportunity to, to grow it. And some of that requires investing in it. And that's like researchers kind of, at universities, you might be able to lead some of that front because we're more exploratory. We get to be on the cutting edge of some of those things. Ideally, find the money for it. That's always the hard part. But I think there's interesting places where you can test some of those hypotheses there and see what happens. But it's not like a clear path, and I don't have a clear picture of it in that sense. Uh, oh, Ryan, you have... Yeah, just maybe that last point, I think that was a key word for me is um, hypothesis. Is Josh, do you have a hypothesis? Could you rephrase that as a hypothesis that we could you know, test, validate, and validate, you know, it's because what you're asking seems very messy. There's a lot of dimensions to it, so. <laughs> My hypothesis is that open science will fail because it doesn't take account of the liability concerns and rapidly releasing uh, scientific results. We, we, we should write that down and then start explaining <laughs> Right, but uh, you know, I think you can look at some of the other open science examples, like uh, uh, sharing of uh, of uh, uh, genetic information and uh, rapid application to COVID uh, as you know potential counterexamples. Where yeah, it, part part is is can you establish a community best practice that if people don't participate or don't follow it, then they're liable as opposed to, oh, they did it, it was risky, it wasn't vetted. Um, so that makes them liable. And and this idea of what is best practice, I think is a very uh, still a evolving issue depending on like what science and what the risks are and all that sort of thing. But if you look at the medical, I think that's, case where it's evolving pretty quickly, right? And <laughs> and I think part of what you're talking about, if I understand correctly, is like releasing science that is built on data or, or systems that aren't working correctly because they're open source or made by everyone, you don't know if it's gonna be right. There are ways and methods that we can build that can test some of those things, can test those things automatically. Like I think of when I worked at in industry, like using pen testing and doing things that are like monkey wrenchers or fun where it's just like, break stuff. Like there are ways to take those same processes used in things that are not scientific research, apply the concepts to scientific research and see what happens when you do that. See if that can actually automate some of those processes that are otherwise incredibly manual. So you can actually test some of the stuff before you put it out to like validate it, have a series of tests. Like there, there's there's a lot of opportunity we can take from the industry standards and pull that in to, to experiment with it. Um, and it, I think there's a attitude shift that has to go with that a little bit to make that happen. But I think the results can make it much more Make make the results stronger when you kind of think about that as, as part of the process. Um, I, I noticed there's a ten minute discrepancy between the computer and my phone, so I think we have five minutes left. 
So we'll take one more question. I don't see anybody posting anything. On it's, Zoom. I, it's just more of a comment, I guess, for the previous discussion. And, you know, we we target for open science and, and, and open data. And, and yes, that, that's obviously a concern. But, you know, we're all also working towards fair principles and, you know, the R and fairs for reproducibility. And if your system or your methodology is flawed, you're not going to be able to have, you know, reproducibility. So that's... So that's the other <laughs> The first hour is confusing, but I'm happy if you want to add that to Oh, oh yeah. So it is the R. I don't know. I say it so many times, but but that's a big part of you know reproducible science is is necessary, and you can't you know build these systems if it doesn't get reproduced. Your methodology is you know you have some problems. Can you say your name and affiliation? Oh, sorry. I'm Stephanie Wingo. I work with NASA Impact. Okay, well, uh, we're coming up. Any other final yeah. questions? Ryan, please. You have to think about it. I think like from a solutions perspective, Josh, we might want to, we'd want to look at it, you know, at least from, from the hat that I have to wear at the government is from a risk reduction or risk management perspective. So a solution would probably have to, you know, define what risks we have and, and define, how, you know, the inputs to this to this thing and then we can start mapping out you know the dimensions of risk reduction right we can reduce risk in this way we can isolate things in containers right we can increase you know automated testing we can do all these things and i think you know if we're really talking about it, trying to figure out a solution that's that's i think where it might be uh fruitful to explore thanks <laughs> yeah well, we can pose the alternative hypothesis that open source is more secure and and less likely to be have major compromises than commercial code. Um, so that, that, as you noted, I mean, that requires practice of a lot of options. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I had a friend who worked at Microsoft a long time ago, and they studied debugging a lot. And uh, the only conclusion they came to after millions of dollars expended was the more you look, the more you find. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. There's so many zero day vulnerabilities that keep coming up on stuff that's been around for a long time. Anyhow, okay. So just uh, last chance for comments. I think uh, Ryan, you kind of did. Uh, Kendall. Sarah, last chance to make any concluding comments. I think one thing that's really interesting um, is, you know, like in the last year we've seen changes to AI models that anyone can interact with. Um, I remember two years ago playing with chat with a GPT-2 and I threw Python into it as an, on a whim and I produced something that was Python-like. I was like, that's kind of crazy. And now we're at a place where these are much more expanded people using it to write code. And I just wonder all the unintended consequences of things that may be reappearing that we thought were solved because it's trained on stuff that's older. Um, and that's gonna be a fascinating and complicated, interesting place um, to see because it's not easy to trace what's being done by that, but you maybe find interesting surprises along the way. <laughs> I had a class I did a lecture in and we we're going through Git with them. Um, and I had three coding examples, one in Python, one in C++, and one in Java. And I got to the end of the class and I'm like, I didn't write two of those. I know Python, I don't know the other two. <laughs> it kind of gave the moment to think about that. And like this, this world's changing quickly. Like you need to be understanding what's happening. Um, and I think that, it, that implications inside of open science and open source world is you know, just beginning, but I'm sure it's there. Um, and it's not bad nor good. That's not the point of that, but it is also something you have to think about and think about this stuff. And the students that are gonna be emerging from universities are definitely using this. Sarah, anything to Tom? Just a reminder that we're having an open house Thursday. <laughs> um, the, um, you, you know, when we designed the panel, we intentionally designed it to sort of present, you know, perspectives from small to large scale. I think we you could have a whole conference on, on this because as Bob said, uh, there are a lot of uh, 
stakeholders that were present. Um, but the, the you, as a work for hire company, basically, basically a consulting firm, um, we know that we're not good at selling product. We're good at selling service. Um, and so for us, the open source model is really effective because our customers in many cases, particularly if they're we're primarily a government contractor, um, they want to see the results uh, be used in and unencumbered by uh, licensing. Um, so, uh, you, you know, as someone trying to run a small company, the open source uh, uh, model really dovetails with sort of the the, the scientific work that we do uh, on a work for hire basis. Right. Well, um, I'll, I'll just add one comment, actually, in response to Kendall that I've just been thinking about, which is, um, you know, the IP issues associated with AI have not even been touched, and that's going to be another whole bag of uh, can of worms or whatever the phrase is. So anyhow, uh, let's thanks, thank the panelists for the presentation and discussion, and thank you for attending and uh, you know, at least being part of this this early discussion, I think, of a, a longer term issue. So thanks a lot. And I guess we're due for reception, right? Great.